Well, good afternoon, everyone, on this glorious day, a beautiful spring day in Washington, D.C. Thank you all for coming in and protecting yourself from the sun for a little while, and you can go back out again. But um, I'm Eric Green, director of the National Human Genome Research Institute, and I want to welcome you to the third lecture in our Genomics and Health Disparities lecture series. Uh, for those who are joining us for the first time, I want to tell you the seminar series that we've put together brings speakers who are recognized not only for their contributions in genomics, but also have extended their focus to address questions of how the field can address the limitations in genomic study, population diversity, and also workforce diversity, and also increase health equity and access to genomic and precision medicine. The speakers uh, that you've been hearing from and will hear from today um, are really demonstrating different approaches to the problem from their own unique uh, perspective and their own unique involvement in genomics research. And we've really tried to span uh, the full landscape of uh, genomics research from basic science, population genomics, translational, and clinical research. And also, you will note that the lecture topics have crossed disciplines and, as you will see from today's talk, actually crosses borders. Um, in addition to NHGRI, uh, we're fortunate to have four co-sponsors for this lecture series. Um, that includes the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, and also the Office of Minority Health at the Food and Drug Administration. So we thank all those groups for partnering with us to put this series together. Well, we're particularly fortunate uh, today to welcome our speaker, a good friend of mine, Dr. Geraldo uh, Jimenez Sanchez. Now, Geraldo um, received his MD from the National Autonomous University of Mexico and his PhD in human genetics and molecular biology from Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Um, he's trained as a pediatrician, also as a geneticist. He's an author, and he's also a businessman. He's perhaps best known, um, at least in genomic circles, for becoming the founding director of the National Institute of Genomic Medicine in Mexico. Um, but his credits certainly go beyond that. I'll tell you at a personal level, um, I've gotten to know him quite well. Uh, he's hosted me a couple of times in, in Mexico, including at uh, one of the opening events for the Institute, the National Institute of Genomic Medicine. And then I returned there recently um, to see how, what a vibrant research organization that has become um, even beyond the time uh, that he has uh, departed from that institute. Well, he led the Genomic Diversity Project in Mexico, where his group published the first catalog of genomic variation in the native and admixed populations. And in this and in subsequent work, he sought to connect the advances in genomics research with innovative and accessible medical therapies. Gerardo has also held numerous positions in international organizations, including the United Nations Scientific Advisory Committee, the World Health Organization, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and is a past council member and current chairman of the Committee on Genomics and Bioeconomy for the Human Genome Organization, or HUGO. Um, he currently wears a couple of hats. He teaches and serves as a program director of genomic medicine and bioeconomy at the Harvard School of Public, of Public Health, but is also the executive president of a company called the Global Biotech Consulting Group in Mexico. Well, we're delighted that he can join us here today to, to share a unique and international perspective on genomics research, diversity, development of genomics research in Mexico and Latin America, and also health equity. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Geraldo. Jimenez Sanchez will be giving a talk entitled Genomics in Mexico, Implications for Healthcare and the Bioeconomy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be here with my colleagues and friends. I want to thank uh, Eric and the GRI and the hosting organizations. Very happy to see uh, colleagues, former uh, colleagues from Hopkins and uh, colleagues that I've uh, uh, interacted with throughout the years. And today, I, um, I'd like to share with you some of the, um, some of the lessons, or probably the principles that we have learned from working in an emerging economy such as Mexico. So when we talk about uh, health and economic disparities, it is sometimes hard to see uh, we need to dig in and look into the different communities to find these kind of disparities. But in emerging economies like Mexico, where they are evolving and becoming a developed country, there are some who can t go along this challenge, and there are some that can't go at that speed, that can't make it and turn it into a developed uh, in, individuals from a developed economy. And thus, you get to see a more dramatic disparity in terms of uh, health 
access economy. And so what I am, um, what I will be showing and sharing with you today is that um, our genomics program, or what we've developed, both uh, genomics, population genomics, genomics medicine, and more recently, genomics into the bioeconomy can help, um, uh, uh, can help meeting with those challenges uh, related to genomics, and, uh, to health access and the bioeconomy, that is economic growth. Um, so, first of all, that is uh, the reason why I thought that uh, showing sort of the overview of what we've uh, done within the last decade in Mexico uh, could be helpful for this uh, purpose. Uh, so, so you know, so you remember uh, Mexico as the country just neighbored down south border, and uh, it is the 11th and most populated uh, country in the world, and it's the second uh, in, in, in America, and the one, the first among those uh, 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 countries where people speak Spanish. And so uh, we were just recently, this uh, earlier today, talking Eric and I, how the language barrier can be a major challenge in important science and technology into a community that does not speak the language in which that, uh, those discoveries and innovation were produced. And so Mexico has um, 65 different ethnic groups. And when I'm say ethnic groups, I'm referring to groups that would have their own language. That is, and many of them, they don't even speak Spanish. Some of them are bilingual, but many of them are not. And so there is a target for, or a, an area where disparities are extremely evident and where we are uh, proposing that genomics could uh, make a difference. So if you go from one place to another, geographically distant parts in Mexico, uh, they have different admixture uh, background. And in terms of uh, genetics, as you know, this is tremendously important. And Mexico, um, as I mentioned, is going through a, a demographic and epidemiological um, transformation, a transition. So you get to see the diseases of the poor and the diseases of the industrialized countries. That is to say, you see infectious diseases at its most, and you get to see more and more obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. So that's a major challenge and a major opportunity for genomics to uh, influence how we uh, conduct uh, healthcare down there. So it was, it was um, early in the century where, when we started planning uh, what uh, genomics could do for Mexico and whether it was worth um, joining uh, the genomics era and, uh, for a country like Mexico. And when I say a country like Mexico, not only do I refer to what I just mentioned before, but I'm talking about a country that was not part of the Human Genome Project. So, so we were way behind down there in terms of the genomics era. And the, the, the uh, considerations were, uh, is it worth jumping in at this point? So we started planning uh, stages and, and trying to see how genomics could help, um, as I said, health equity and development in Mexico. And um, so we thought, you know, genomics medicine, genomic medicine will benefit diseases, as I said, of, of the developing industrialized countries. It will contribute developing uh, a more prevention-oriented public health policies and promote a more recent expanse in healthcare. Th those were part of the uh, uh, reasons why we decided to move on into genomic medicine, uh, or Mexico decided to. Um, genomic medicine can contribute to better health and social well-being. And if we do it timely, and timely, I will, it's the key word, if we do it timely, it would contribute to reduce uh, social gaps. Whereas if we do it late, it will only increase those gaps because then we'll be able, we would be at the mercy of those countries, say, who have developed genomic medicine. And then those who didn't participate in innovation will just have to pay the price of using their knowledge and uh, products of innovation. So we thought that, uh, you know, genomic medicine cannot be imported, and this is the admixture um, uh, uh, in the background uh, uh, reason why we can just uh, cut and paste from what it's developed in the European or North American uh, countries into a country like Mexico, and it will certainly stimulate uh, scientific research on local health problems, building infrastructure, and a country's competitiveness in the context of a knowledge-based economy. Finally, we thought it would be 
a good uh, driver for knowledge, as I said, for innovation and knowledge-based economy. So we worked uh, intensively with the Mexican government, academy, and, uh, and, and society to put together an institution that would uh, coordinate all the efforts in genomic medicine in Mexico. So we did that. So this was in 2002 and 2003, and it was in 2004, and we see President Fox at that time signing the law created our National Institute of Genomic Medicine, uh, the 11th NIH for Mexico, our NIH GRI equivalent uh, down there. And uh, that was 2004. And later, um, we start, so we started working in uh, temporary, um, I did some, what did I do? Okay. So we started working in, um, and um, uh, uh, initial facilities, and then the following year, I remember, we started uh, building what would be our NHGRI, our Inmigen, and here you see September 2005, and uh, uh, to the right, we see Secretary, former Secretary of Health, Julio Frank, then Professor Sobral and myself, and Francis Collins, who was gracious enough to, go to, to come and support this initiative for, um, this is the groundbreaking ceremony, what turned out to be later uh, uh, this building, which is in the campus of the NIH um, down South Mexico City. Then, um, so we started working in different projects. One of them, one of the starting projects was the Mexican Genomic Diversity Project. And this was sort of, uh, as Eric mentioned before, sort of to produce a catalog of uh, genetic variants that could uh, uh, help um, in, um, could help in taking into account the admixture for different uh, genome-wide association studies and uh, other projects that we had in mind. So one of the uh, initial motivations for this project was that the uh, phase one of the HapMap project at that time did not include any Hispanic or Latino population. There were, it was focused on the ancestral Asian, European, and African population, as you remember. And so we decided to conduct these uh, this uh, research program and uh, very much in, 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 in communication with, uh, with the Lander group and the whole HapMap group so that we could uh, work along similar lines. And we ended up um, genotyping about uh, 1.5 million SNPs in copy number variants in the Mexican populations, both in mestizo, that is the most common mixture of indigenous and Spaniard group, European groups, and in uh, indigenous populations in, in Mexico. And we did the whole analysis as to um, uh, characterizing the uh, makeup of the genomic populations. And then we uh, made sure that we uh, published that uh, in, in, uh, for everyone, uh, academic-based uh, and uh, private-based in Mexico so, and internationally so that we could, um, could uh, profit all, of them, all of, uh, from that. But probably the uh, major point I want to make about this part of the, uh, uh, of the project is that we were very focused in engaging the um, uh, underserved uh, population, the underserved uh, communities, mainly the different indigenous groups and those groups that were contributing with the blood sample that we wanted to make sure that we were really knowing what they were doing, what the, what the importance of this was. And so we started, uh, we did a, a, a top to bottom approach and then bottom top. And here is just to, just, you don't need to look at details, but this is just to show the states where we uh, sampled uh, admixed and indigenous populations. And in the small figures, uh, pictures around the map, um, uh, there is the governor of every state supporting the initiative. So this provided a lot of credibility uh, to the project. It is today, when I see back this, is 10 states with the governor uh, being the first ones to, to, to donate a blood sample, that was quite something, a setting example for the community and, and making sure that the community will trust uh, what we were doing. And, um, and so we invested a lot of time in informing the community. And what, one of the things we did with the consent form, we did a very explicit consent form. And so we, we did lectures all around the country and a week before sampling uh, those individuals, we would uh, we would uh, public we uh, we will we will publicly uh, share the consent form. So we will leave those consent forms in the form of a poster and leave it for a week. 
in uh, markets, you know, main plazas, universities, libraries, so that people will freely look at it and decide whether they wanted to join or not. To my surprise, the day of sample collection, there were long lines before we opened at seven in the morning, people who wanted to contribute to this project. And not only that, but we also did it in the indigenous, in the ethnic uh, populations in a very similar way. It wasn't easy to get to those populations either because of their own structure, uh, social structure, or because of the remoteness of uh, where, they are, where they're located. But just to share with you in this figure, in this uh, photograph, uh, we see the same, um, the same um, consent form. And for those of you who can read Spanish, it's the first three lines are in Spanish, but the rest of it is in the indigenous language and the ethnic language. Uh, pretty complex to translate genomic diversity and those concepts that, that uh, were uh, hard to explain. But the whole, again, the whole six page in, uh, consent form was uh, translated into and um, used in the form of a poster. And we see here Alejandra from my, from my group and other people from, from my group um, uh, uh, going through the process of consent publicly in the open so that people, whether they would consent, they will take a copy of their consent form and take it home so that they could always have it and see who to contact and how to go about that. And we, um, we sample different uh, indigenous communities around the country. And as I said, 65 different ethnic groups, uh, different languages that are not even similar. It's not like English and French. This is completely different languages. Uh, and so it was, it was pretty complex. But it was it turned out to be pretty um, uh, useful in terms of having uh, consent and engagement from the community. So time passed, and a year later, we had uh, the results of our half map or a half type uh, catalog of our population. And this is just the principal components uh, 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 plot. But what I want to show here, these are the three ancestral populations from the HAP map, the original HAP map. And so the question was, where would, where would Mexicans plot? Will there be a concise group just like these three ancestral populations? And it turns out, when you plot them all together, uh, it turns out that uh, there are, first of all, there's smear of uh, this distribution in this plot. They're not really um, overlapping any of the ancestral populations. And to our surprise, we thought, you know, on the one end, you have the European component, which makes sense, and then you have the rest of the mestizo Mexicans. Some of them with the more towards the more uh, African um, ancestry, and this makes sense. These are the two states in Mexico where you get to see uh, African ancestry. But then we were expecting that the Asian would be on the other end here. You know, since they came all along to America and uh, funded these areas, well, it turns out they weren't. They were far from here. And um, when we analyze the very indigenous population, so this is the mixed population, and the indigenous population turn out to show up there. That's the Zapotecs from Oaxaca in Mexico, which, which clearly showed the other end of the spectrum. And so um, it, it really showed that uh, analyzing an admixed population, it's pretty, uh, it's not as straightforward as analyzing just the uh, ancestral non-mixed population. So when we ask uh, what are the proportion, proportion of ancestral contribution to the Mexican uh, populations by region, we see here in the four, in, in the four columns, this is from the HAP map, the European, Japanese, and Chinese, the uh, Yoruban from Africa. And here in blue is the Amerindian. And you see the six states here I'm showing, six states in average. Um, you see some of them have a more European contribution, whereas some others, like Guerrero and Veracruz, they have a lot more uh, ancestral indigenous contribution. And as I showed before, some of them have some African contribution. And that led to the first catalog of, uh, of uh, genetic variation in, the, in genomic uh, 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 in, in the Mexican population, which we made available just as the HAP map did, we just even actually even um, uh, uh, divided by by every SNP by uh, allele frequencies by state. You see here Guerrero, Guanajuato, Sonora, Veracruz at the bottom here. Uh, so we'll see we'll we'll show uh, 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 minor allele frequencies that well allele frequencies for every SNP by the states an analyzed, and this has helped to. Um, to understand uh, genetic variation, which actually had been uh, 
uh, pretty useful when we talk about implementing pharmacogenomics and those other uh, ampli uh, uh, um, applications that had to do with certain number of uh, variants. Then we, the initial question was, um, with the HAP map cover for the Mexican population, and here we show how the um, how the percentage with the percentage of uh, common haplotypes uh, share in the Mexican population, and we observe that the Yoruban uh, cover for 64 percent of the Mexican haplotypes, whereas the Asian 74 and the, um, the Europeans 80. So if you want to capture 93% of the diversity in Mexico, you will need to add haplotypes for these three populations. Whereas if you want to capture 96%, you will have to put all, this, all the hap, all, all haplotypes together and we'll, you will only capture 96%. From these, uh, we derive all the series of studies that, will, will, uh, that help us uh, say normalize our population, correct for ancestry and some other studies, so that would make would increase our power to um, significance uh, to detect uh, 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 variants uh, that influence common disease. So we ended up, of course, uh, 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 this project, uh, the following administration when the institute was created, and it was my responsibility as a founder director to uh, bring the results to the president, and he announced that. Uh, the wrap-up of this project was announced, and not only uh, did we um, published results, but there were comic books and other means to to share with, again, with the underserved populations and those who uh, gave uh, a sample. Uh, so what we did once we announced, uh, we, we toured again the whole country, uh, bringing back the results to the communities so that people will learn, not, not the the uh, PNAS paper, but in addition to that, the uh, uh, different comics and different uh, ways to express uh, how important their uh, participation in the project was. And so from that, uh, we have followed with several projects, uh, several projects that uh, entail fine mapping of the Mexican populations, um, genomic analysis of ancestry in different ways, not only in Mexico, we have joint efforts with colleagues like uh, Carlos Bustamante and others so that we've analyzed uh, populations from Alaska to Patagonia altogether um, in, in trying to learn about migration and ancestry. Uh, and then we uh, jumped into uh, GWAS for um, age-related macular degeneration, uh, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular, and some other disorders, including um, uh, cancer, cardi uh, infectious diseases, uh, and others that had to do with pharmacogenomics and cancer. And so um, we started analyzing and trying to find if there were uh, variants that influence common disease in Mexico uh, as opposed to uh, uh, others uh, discovered in other populations. And this is just an example from uh, work from Eros Balam in my lab, where he uh, analyzed uh, variants in the uh, AGT uh, gene and its influence in uh, risk for hypertension. And so he find, and he actually found some, uh, a haplotype that turned out to have two influential variants that uh, composed a single haplotype that was uh, pretty common in the indigenous and the admix population that would increase risk to uh, hypertension. And uh, later down the road, uh, he uh, found that um, there were some of these uh, 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 risk variants uh, turn out to be together in certain individuals. And so he found super alleles here, what we call super alleles. In, at the bottom, for example, we see the AGT3 that combines four uh, high-risk alleles and increases ORs to 3.3, uh, really uh, indicating that there were major components uh, of the ancestral populations of Mexico influencing hypertension. In this case, he uh, actually follow up on this uh, haplotype and turned out that he discovered that was an ancestral haplotype that came from the very indigenous um, uh, populations in Mexico. So here we were, here we were moving from, um, from, uh, from just describing what the, um, what the population was to finding some, uh, initial uh, polymorphisms related to common disease of interest in Mexicans. And, and so we began to see that it, would, it actually made sense to jump in timely into the genomics arena and trying to move into uh, common disease.
So later down the road, uh, there was the ambitions to uh, the ambition to um, to to join into other major programs that would help again help uh, help disparities in Mexico. So that not only would it help help uh, solving health disparities, but would um, would prevent from making those gaps wider, as I said before. So uh, we join efforts on an unprecedented. Uh, 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 a synergy between our institute and the Broad Institute, uh, where uh, uh, Eric Lander and I uh, had uh, submitted a grant to the Carlos Slim Foundation. I'm sure you have heard of Carlos Slim. Um, he has a lot of money, and uh, he uh, he was uh, willing to support genomics. So we uh, ended up um, uh, submitting a grant that turned out to be funded, and um, and so that was to. So sort of characterize the uh, different cancers in Mexico and common disorders such as diabetes, type two diabetes, and um, and and um, cardiovascular disease. So, so you know, uh, the um, these studies. What we're trying to do, as I said, is to uh, find um, variants in our population that would be rare to other populations. And this is uh, work from uh, this alliance between our institute and other NIHs in Mexico with the Broad Institute, uh, funded by Carlos Slim under the SIGMA initiative for type two diabetes. And um, this uh, turns out the type two diabetes uh, has a prevalence roughly twice as uh, US non-Hispanic white. So it's a very, prevalent in Mexico. And so the approach was to analyze uh, about uh, 8,000 Mexicans and other Latin Americans, half or uh, 3.8K with uh, type 2 diabetes and the rest uh, non-diabetic controls with about 9.2 SNPs um, and trying to identify uh, 9.2 million SNPs and trying to identify those regions that would be a risk to Mexico, to the Mexican population. And it turns out that uh, the uh, the study showed, uh, or part of the, the results showed, identify a um, a region and this salute uh, carrier um, that uh, was that, that that increased risk to diabetes in the Mexican population of uh, about twenty uh, percent. Uh, and this association, interestingly, those who had this haplotype. Uh, are younger and leaner individuals uh, uh, at risk for diabetes or with diabetes as opposed to uh, other variants identified so far. And so this haplotype turned out to increase about 20% the risk for uh, type 2 diabetes in the Mexican population. And what was interesting is that this is almost, almost a private haplotype for the Mexican population. And that's that's pretty cool. I mean, if you see, if you're trying to do something for your population, analyzing your background and trying to uh, hit into one of the major uh, health problems in Mexico, uh, let me let me let me show you how this haplotype that carries for amino acid substitution substitution in this protein um, is common. So there is a reference uh, sequence, and there is the one with the uh, 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 four missions and the silent limitation, the five uh, SNP. Uh, haplotype, and then there is less, less frequent uh, this other intermediate um, haplotype. When we ask in the uh, in the thousand genome project how frequent this allele this haplotype was, it turned out here we see that the reference is as uh, frequent in the African, in the European, in Asian, and even in Mexico. But the rare uh, haplotype that confers risk. It's zero in Africans, two in Europeans, 12 in Asians, and almost one third of the Mexican population. So they reanalyzed the uh, population, those individuals, those uh, thousands of individuals that were part of the study. And what was found was that this is the, the, the ones participated in the Sigma study. And um, given that we have ancestry markers for these individuals, we could separate of all the ones that um, participated and those individuals that were more of the uh, Native American, Native uh, Amerindian individuals. And you can see here that this uh, becomes uh, very common in, in, in the Mexican population and in, in the um, uh, uh, Amerindian population. So clearly, um, um, the fact that we can approach those communities and then tackle some of the risk for type 2 diabetes becomes to make sense in, in, in terms of uh, how genomics can um, help those 
that are that are um, under these underserved uh, populations, and starting for Mexico as a whole, but then uh, having in um, as a part of the equation um, the uh, indigenous populations. So this is these are examples as to how genomic medicine is moving down in Mexico, uh, at least at, on the research level. Uh, but later we. Um, I was interested in uh, I, uh, my my work at the OECD, um, uh, chairing the biotech uh, 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 area, um, uh, led me to learn how developed countries use science to create wealth, and and this is this is for me for me at that time that was revealing how. Um, those countries use it, you know, to for a cleaner environment, for better uh, mining uh, and ex uh, mineral extraction, for health, for better food, for better milk, and how genomics was more and more becoming a key player into the bioeconomy. So we started defining a new strategy, say a second component or a new component of strategy that was what about uh, uh, using genomics for other means in Mexico, and so here is some of the um, some of here is just represented some of the ideas of uh, using um, genomics to tackle or to meet global challenges, not only in human health but animal medicine, agriculture, food, aquaculture, environment, and energy, amongst others. And and certainly it was it was time, and there were four or five elements that uh, indicated it was time to migrate from just human health to innovation in different areas. And 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 one of the elements you're familiar with because this is data from here. Uh, it was it's the cost of uh, of sequencing that has dropped so dramatically that it was it was possible to to sequence thousands of cows or thousands of rice uh, plants and so on. So that along with the fact that there were thousands of, uh, of uh, species that were becoming sequenced and uh, the, their sequence was uh, uh, publicly available along the, along the line. So those were two key elements. Then as genomic medicine proved the principle that we could uh, identify genes for common disease, and again, this is data from you guys, um, how the human genome uh, has been, uh, how uh, genes related to common disease have been, um, uh, common and rare diseases have been identified throughout the genome. That was another indicator that uh, studying genomes could be useful and results could uh, could uh, be obtained in the, in the form of uh, 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 associated uh, polymorphisms to specific traits. Why not uh, high economic value traits such as protein in the milk, so, uh, uh, such as um, uh, better protein in rice, so submergence tolerance, and so on. So that and then later, uh, I'm sure you know that the uh, Battelle report came with the uh, economic uh, um, result of the analysis of the Human Genome Project with the return of investment of uh, $141 per dollar that later turned out to be $170 per dollar uh, invested in the human genome. And boy, when you think about uh, the importance of investing on time in, 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 um, in, in, in science and innovation, well, it was, it was clearly a, a, a call for attention in the sense to say we can uh, translate those principles and use it in a way that could be helpful not only for health but for other uh, global challenges in the world. So clearly, we, uh, we 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 clearly saw that there was this opportunity for genomics innovation, connecting those ideas for people across sectors, not only those of us working in a biomedical lab, but from other sectors and daring to talk to them and daring to identify challenges. And then of course, uh, having a way to su get sustained uh, investment in large science and technology innovation. Uh, again, sustained is, is a key word uh, that, uh, it's, it's a key word for the rest of the world, probably not so much in the US where investment uh, science, in science and technology is pretty much uh, sustain all the directors have to struggle for the budget year to year. But but this is a, a pretty much a policy, whereas in other countries, the sustained investment is key so that the, the, so that knowledge can be translated into uh, products and services that can be useful for 
uh, the economy and for human well-being. And there, and there are many examples that we've studied so, so far. Uh, one that called my attention uh, recently um, in Asia, and then I learned that we do that in Mexico as well, is the palm oil. The palm oil that um, is the major uh, source of food, biomass, the climate change mitigation. This is a picture I took from a plane as I was landing into um, Malaysia for, uh, the Hugo, for a Hugo OECD meeting on the innovation. Clearly, uh, this is a major source of oil, either both for as edible oil and, um, and, and vegetable oil for other purposes. And clearly, uh, it's an important source of biofuels. And, and there are ways, this is a plant that actually it's, it uses uh, very well uh, CO2 from the environment. So it, it really, it's a clean technology to produce biofuels. And so it turns out that uh, this oil in Asia and in Latin America, its, uh, it's economy is growing as it is in the rest of the world. But it turns out that this oil comes from, uh, from the seed or the fruit that we see here. And this is the, the most efficient combination in the fruit, so to produce uh, most of oil, of, of the oil. And it turns out these proportions of uh, the kernel both, uh, and the mesocarp uh, is uh, controlled by the shell gene. And by uh, selecting through uh, the shell gene, uh, you can identify the, um, those two that are really not, of no use for oil or very little use for oil production. But having the heterozygote, the Tenera uh, version, actually increases significantly the amount of use produced. So clearly, this model has been just the selection, the timely selection using uh, genomics in these plants can save up to six years uh, while people wait to see whether their plant turned out to be the, the Tenera or the other ones, the useful or the other ones. Uh, and so these programs are now being implemented in Southeast Asia and Mexico uh, using genomics as it is for other industries. This is agriculture, but in terms of food, the poultry industry that is growing like crazy, uh, uh, this is the US, but it's growing like crazy and and, 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 and around the world, well, now genomics is, it's found its way into this industry since, um, since one single male birth in, in this, uh, what is called the breeding nucleus, uh, can have impact in millions of animals and millions of uh, a lot of, uh, you can see here, a lot of meat. If there is a mutation that, or more mutations that you don't want or are not uh, useful for this industry, that would pretty much kill an industry if, uh, say for example, the disease gene gets into the picture at the early stage, 21 years later when the chickens are uh, uh, pop up, you get to see disease uh, chicken that are, that are produced in, by millions. So nowadays, um, uh, genomics uh, have identified polymorphisms that got to do with all these high value traits. And this has moved the industry so dramatically. So for example, if you see here how this had been, has been useful for uh, selection, poultry selection throughout the years, you can see what the uh, breast was in, in the 80s as to what they can get now. This is not transgenic, this is not, this is just selection and you can see the presenters percentage of yield, breast and fat that uh, people can get from uh, selecting these animals. And, and not only did this, but other traits that are of high economic interest, such as feed conversion, um, how much an animal has to eat um, to produce the right amount of uh, food in the, in the 40, uh, 42 days period of time they have for production. Uh, clearly, those uh, polymorphisms that they've uh, found to select animals for the, with a better um, feed conversion turn out to be highly valuable to, to the industry that has, that once again meets or has to do with one of the major challenges around the world, which is food security for, the, for, for around the world. So with this and other examples, uh, different countries, including this one, has put out their national bioeconomy strategies. And this is not, this is not only for um, the most developed countries, but also others like, uh, South Africa, Korea, Malaysia, 
uh, other countries uh, around the world, Brazil included, have uh, put out uh, strategies as to how to use uh, the um, uh, biotechnology or bio. Uh, mostly, when you when you go through these documents, you see that they're mostly genomics. This is genomics all over the place in agriculture, food, health, environment, and and many uh, energy and other areas. If 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 uh, if you're not familiar with at least with the U.S. document. Uh, uh, I will I will recommend reading this uh, really easy to read document as to how governments are trying to use uh, uh, bio biotechnology mainly genomics to uh, for economic growth and so so clearly life science is a common denominator but genomics and healthcare is again a major denominator a common denominator in these uh, bioeconomies agenda so clearly around the world genomics is getting down to the bottom of the uh, most uh, important challenges, uh, both for health and access to food and and, and clean environments mainly. Um, so with this in mind, we decided to go one step beyond and we established a new um, organization in Mexico uh, to follow this uh, path called Genomics and Bioeconomy. Actually, it's called in Spanish, Genomica y Bioeconomia, which actually what it does is it has this, it, it stimulates this uh, innovation cir virtual circle by putting together uh, business, government, and academia uh, focused on high value, economic value, uh, or health value um, uh, uh, projects, programs. And um, actually, this had, uh, even though Mexico doesn't have a bioeconomy blueprint, actually it has this in, in a practical sense. This is uh, a major initiative that we launched uh, a couple of years ago, uh, and uh, we launched it in a meeting with the OECD, and we see here the uh, Secretary General at the OECD, from the OECD, in this middle, genomics, innovation, and economic growth. And we see Eric Green here uh, 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 collaborating and uh, joining efforts with us, and we're very grateful for that. Uh, uh, the uh, interaction with NHGRI throughout the years has been just tremendously useful. And I'm, I'd like to uh, close by, uh, by sharing with you a couple of examples of what we're doing uh, in terms of uh, bringing genomics to bioeconomy. One is uh, strategies to get more and better food by introducing genomic selection into the dairy industry in Mexico. So uh, again, disparities, health, economic, social disparities, we're trying to bring genomics into here into one of the major sources of protein for the Mexican population. So the way it works, it's pretty much the same we do here with diabetes or hypertension. It's just that it's a different mammal. But it's just, you know, at the beginning, it was a little daring to start analyzing different genomes from this species. But clearly the point here is that they look alike they very much look alike, but after two years that you invest in feeding them, growing them, you know, cultivating them, turns out some of them produce a lot of milk and some of them don't. Some of them actually produce very little milk. So how do you get to know which will produce what volume, what amount of protein, what amount of fat? How come industry can select these cows will be for the yogurt industry, more fat, less volume, this uh, cows will be for more volume, less fat for the milk market, and so on. Well, it turns out the difference for all that is just haplotypes. And in this industry, they don't even care about the gene. They just care about the haplotype. They just identify haplotypes link, uh, uh, to associate it with uh, your uh, trait of interest, and boom, that's that. So in the U.S., this is done routinely. And what's happened throughout the years in terms of co uh, economy is that the average net merit, that is the value the, in dollars of, of, the, of these herds have been increasing gradually as genomics has made a way into Holstein. Uh, and and this, is a, this is not a net mixed population. This is a very pure population when there is no random mating. There is, a, there is very clear uh, uh, um, uh, uh, protocol as to how to mate them and reproduce them. So it's a pretty clean, uh, strategy. So the straightforward thing to do with uh, with our strategy was since most of the Mexican Holstein industry purchases their semen from U.S. companies, we thought you know it must be same Holstein, so we can use uh, same predictive equation than USDA. And boom, when they did it, when we did it, 
uh, uh, those precisions were right there. Those predictions were not that uh, uh, accurate as they were in the U.S. So we went back to the lab, and this is work by uh, Felipe Ruiz um, uh, in, in, in Mexico, that where he shows a blue hosting from the U.S. and Canada, and red and, and green are hosting from Mexico. So even though they purchase their semen from the U.S., something happens in the way, namely uh, not random mating, but some mating uh, uh, that provides some heat uh, tolerance to the Mexican cows that actually make them shift from the initial group of the Canadian and the Mexican, uh, I'm sorry, the Canadian and the U.S. So they're similar, but not that similar. They look identical, but that in the inside, they're not identical, as we can see here. So clearly, we needed to run some GWASs in some, uh, some, uh, some ways to retrain those SNPs that would identify haplotypes of uh, interest. And by doing that, we'll re refocus the um, target for, for prediction on these traits. And so we chose to do uh, volume, milk volume, protein, fat, Longevity and um, and structure. Uh, there is there are some traits that compose the structure of the cow that are important for production. And so we once again went around the country with this. Now this time with the industry. And this is the uh, this is uh, one of the largest dairy industries in Mexico. And we joined forces uh, and went throughout the country. Uh, this is where they're located in trying to identify what exactly their um, their model of production was. What having a catalog of all their hundreds and thousands and thousands of uh, animals. So basically, what we do with this, we are genotyping right now about uh, about six thousand um, selected individuals with cows with the specific traits. Uh, so just in the same way we do uh, with humans for specific diseases, uh, and then with that, we will be able to identify those that serve for uh, that have a, a, a higher uh, genetic value, and of course that helps to assist the reproduction. And we will be able, and as as they do in the U.S. and Canada, to predict as they do in U.S., Canada, Australia, and pretty much all Europe, to predict uh, traits of high economic value and moving genomics into the bioeconomy. And one last thing that we're doing, um, and to facilitate access to underserved uh, communities and have them engage with the uh, with our health programs in Mexico, is we um, we're trying, we're testing some of the pharmacogenetic genetic tests available to all of the population. Initially, those were produced, uh, those were analyzed in blood samples as we did with our half map, and then in uh, tubes of saliva samples. But then we moved the, this technology in our laboratory to have those uh, in um, filter paper, paper uh, uh, saliva samples so that we could reach almost any community across the country. And so what we did, we, uh, we did a filter use analyzing what are the, the most pressing health challenges in Mexico, cardiovascular, metabolic, cancer, and accidents are. And then we ask, okay, for which of them do we have a pharmacogenomic test uh, for the, the, that serves the drugs that are mostly used for those common disorders? Once we have them, we ask two things. For which of them there is a FDA label recommendation uh, where the, uh, gen where the uh, genetic test can be, pharmacogenomic test can be used, and for which of them are there international therapeutic guidelines so that we can really uh, maintain our efforts within the range of, of uh, tests that have been proven in other populations. So we ended up with a dozen of uh, with the dozen drugs that are used in Mexico, and and translated that as I said in a small kit is pretty much a Ziploc bag with the filter paper that we are uh, using throughout the different communities in the country to survey what the uh, different uh, polymorphisms are and whether um, whether uh, there is need for pharmacogenomics. And and I was mentioning earlier today that in Mexico there is no policy for pharmacogenomics. And so what we're trying to create here is the evidence that there need to be pharmacogenomics policy uh, in Mexico. And, and one of the part of the evidence that we're creating and we were asked by policymakers uh, was 
is there really evidence that those polymorphisms exist in Mexico? Is there really need for pharmacogenomics in Mexico? And this is just a, a cut of, the, uh, of, a, of a sample of a population across the country that we did. And, and the column, the percentage column, indicates the patients that require those adjustments based on these tests. So clearly, clearly, this is pretty much as common as in every nation, uh, particularly uh, thrilled by, by the warfaring uh, uh, result where the majority of the Mexicans tested require uh, ju uh, dose adjustment. Um, I was telling Eric earlier today that included myself, my wife, my kids, almost a, a, a lot of people uh, around us, 71% require uh, a tremendous, uh, significant adjustment in warfare. But for the rest of them, hey, there is market, uh, uh, there is need for, um, for, for this kind of testing. And we're providing this evidence for lawmakers, for our FDA equivalent to produce uh, this kind of uh, policy that we need. And, 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 and in, my, uh, in closing, I'd like to, uh, to tell you that we're moving this um, uh, even forward. We decided to select a series of genes, polymorphisms for obesity, diabetes, and dyslipidemias. Uh, many of them that have been discovered in the Mexican populations and others that have been replicated in, in uh, Caucasians and other populations and uh, sort of uh, have a survey, uh, in, survey them in different uh, areas of Mexico, Mexico as a country, not Mexico City, where there are different prevalences of the disease. So there is a question, uh, do these uh, mutations accumulate in certain areas where there is more of the disease. We know certain, or, or what is the component of the environment. So for example, uh, there are communities where there is no obesity nor diabetes, then these individuals migrate to the US and after a couple of years when they come back, they're obese and diabetic. Uh, what happened? What was the, what, what happened in terms of, of, the, of the environment? What's, what's the genetic makeup in terms of, of uh, risk alleles in that population? And like that, there are other uh, uh, interesting phenomena that we're assaying assign, uh, through these experiments. So, so there's no question what we do in the laboratory, in the institute, and what we do in terms of research, that it's important for uh, health uh, to ameliorate health and economic disparities, whether it's genomics research, technology convergence, uh, integrating this into electronic medical records, cost-effective analyses, education, and all these other efforts that we do. But in order to move them uh, through the bioeconomy, so my reflection is that there is, it is key that we move that knowledge into getting and producing uh, new products, new services, new ways to meet the most pressing challenges that a society has. And particularly, as I said before, the, those uh, communities, those underserved communities uh, within a society. So that's why it's so important to, 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 in, to include them from the beginning. But in order for this to become a reality, well, number one, we need serious research and funding and all the ones that, all the things that I mentioned before. But in my mind, it is clear that doing all these uh, so in order that we can, so in order that we can um, integrate them into one uh, effective platform, we clearly need uh, sound and forward-looking policies. Without these kind of policies, uh, it is it is very difficult to make a difference and to help genomics ameliorate health and economic dis and economic disparities. And and uh, and as you uh, know. I'm talking, I'm referring about policies uh, that is needed depending on the country, depending on the community in different areas, including here the ones that I list, education, access, reimbursement, uh, funding mechanisms in science, knowledge share, intellectual property, commercialization, public engagement, and, and several others where we, in my mind, have the responsibility or the opportunity to uh, educate our policymakers so that we can have timely and forward-looking uh, time policies to make genomics an instrument, as I said, to ameliorate uh, health and economic disparities. I'll stop here and I'll be happy to answer any question. Thank you.
Hi, so it's a very nice talk, and I think I have my question is related to the bioeconomics. So how how can you envision that if you're skewing, for example, a crop or a specific animal strain to make better product, better food production, that you may have the risk of making them susceptible to a future infection or a plague? So at that point, is it important to have variability, or or how are the rules that will actually cover for the skewing as of a specific crop or bioeconomics. I don't know. That's a very good point. So, so we've learned that uh, diversity is key, and I would completely agree with that. What I'm, what I'm talking about here is selecting for a specific trait as opposed to making identical animals, uh, namely transgenic animals or plants, for example. Not that I'm against, uh, but that's not the point of discussion. The, the point here is just as the uh, Asian population, Asian countries have selected for submergence tolerance rise, is just selecting for the sub one gene in their seeds with the rest of it being as diverse it is, as it is in nature. Same, same applies for, um, for the cattle experiment here, uh, both in the US and Canada and Mexico. Uh, it's just certain, um, selecting certain traits I'm, I'm sorry, a certain haplotypes that provides higher value uh, in terms of prediction, but the rest, the rest stays the same. And, and this is just to say I, I absolutely agree with you on the point of the diversity or the risks that uh, convey not having diversity in a population. One question I had is in, in thinking about especially economic stimulation of, of catalyzed by genomics. C compare and contrast what's happening in Mexico with other parts of Latin America and South America? Yeah, so um, so what happens in, in, in Latin America is the most important genomics core cores are in Brazil and Mexico. When you see the level of investment, Brazil has three times more investment in genomics innovation as opposed to Mexico. Um, one of the reasons I, I, I tend to believe is that um, that they're very focused in an economic uh, 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 high economic value of projects that that pushes them to to increase, and they don't have the U.S. next door uh, that would help uh, with technology and and other means. Whereas in Mexico, um, uh, number one, we have a lot of interaction, and number two, uh, due to other social um, phenomena uh, that um, don't help that don't help innovation. I think that people are more cautious as to how much they invest uh, in bringing genomics to bioeconomy. But this is growing and growing, and and we saw the same pattern with South Africa, with uh, Korea, uh, uh, going little by little, and then taking taking off. So while Brazil is investing more, is it distributed across similar areas, or I mean, or, or just take healthcare and genomic medicine specifically? Is it proportional no. between the two? No, um, healthcare. Brazil will be focused in cancer, period, mm -hmm. and that will be very located. But uh, genomics and agriculture, that is across the country, yeah. and they're very focused in agriculture. Whereas Mexico, it will be medicine and very little in our other areas now that we're beginning to explore other areas. And you, you emphasize pharmacogenomics, but you must be also doing this in cancer as well. Right, absolutely, yeah. And, and what I found with our, with our what, we, what I described with our uh, private variants for diabetes and other areas, uh, there are some mutations found in Mexican tumors that uh, they are more amenable to certain treatment. Charles. Yeah, yeah great talk. I, I was just, it's really great that you're linking genomics to the economy, but I'm wondering, is there evidence, or are you beginning to see evidence that this improvement is not just a way to increase the profit of the big companies, is it really trickling down to the people in terms of reduced cost uh, of food? And so, food? so increasing profit from, uh, from uh, international companies across the world that's a rule across the world, whether it's genomics or not, right? But my, what we've learned is that if we have a society, government, academia, business, all together, 
uh, trying to funnel this knowledge into benefits for the general population. That can be done as well, and that is not that can be run in parallel with the other big companies that um, that uh, that look for their increasing their profits. Now, what I well, what I've learned is that when we show the kind of market that they can access uh, by having huge volumes with low cost tests or otherwise, uh, that becomes interesting. And what they need, I, I mean, that is, becomes attractive to them so that they be part of, of these efforts. So they are able to separate uh, their, their big business efforts with their um, um, innovation, uh, global or general society, or even um, ethnic groups and, and less uh, um, sort of population. So you can work both of them. At least in Mexico, we have worked both channels at the same time, and it does work. It's not to be against profit. That's a big business thing, and everybody, right. you know, does. it's really the, the fact that you tied your talk to her disparity, you know, to disparities. And therefore, if we're going to go through this process and we're going to impact on, you know, on equal access to food and health and all of that, then there has to be a policy structure that takes advantage of this improvement. Otherwise, it stays at the level of just production. So that's when I see uh, the benefit of harnessing uh, government, uh, academia, and business under a non-for-profit like our organization, under a non-for-profit organization that can make sure that these uh, benefits are funneled to the population. We have run, we're running two or three pilots at this point. I wouldn't be surprised. And I'm not surprised that we will have to, you know, to to fight at some point with uh, other interests in this equation, but. But at least in, in the two or three uh, pilots that we're running, this is this is happening and, and they're being part of it. Last question here. Um, thanks for your talk. Are there any um, are, are there any projects that involve next generation sequencing in, in Mexico? Um, any big population uh, type studies? So um, the answer is there are good ideas, good initiatives. Um, when you, I recently surveyed the number of next gen uh, equipment that are at our NIH campus, and they're way too many as opposed to the number of projects that where there's funding to run those experiments. So people focus on getting their own machine, which is part of our human scientific nature at some point, but, uh, or, or developing country uh, uh, culture. But um, but then they don't get they, they're not able to get any funding for for their uh, next gen. Particularly nowadays when this is becoming a commodity and you can send your samples to Korea or anywhere else to to do next gen. But the answer is there are several projects. Few of them are running. Uh, tons of machines uh, in, in in Mexico. Although uh, Illumina reports that they sell three times as much uh, equipments and reagents in Brazil as opposed to Mexico. Um, but most of the next-gen machines that I know, uh, which are many, not really producing the data that they should be, uh, and that's because people think of uh, the machine, not the reagents and the you know support of the project. Okay, please join me in thanking Gerardo for our terrific Thank you. Talk. Thank you, Eric, Thanks so much. Muchas gracias, sí. Gracias, 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 muchas gracias por venir.